So to kick us off, we have University of Southern California. Uh, and right. Annenberg. Cool. Like it. Great. Hi, James. Uh, thanks for joining. Hi there. Uh, my, my pleasure. So, yeah, first thing I want to touch on. Um, so while the film is noted as being based on both Lewis Carroll's books uh, and the original Disney movie, from a fan's perspective, it seems based more heavily on Through the Looking Glass with the inclusion of key characters from the first book. And my question is, um, will, this, will this movie go back and cover story elements from Through the Looking Glass that were left out along with the additional storyline created for the movie, or will it be just a continuation of the first movie with the completely original storyline? Yeah, good question. Um, well, the, 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 book, the book is obviously very important, and it's hugely important to me, because obviously growing up in England, I've read this book a hundred times, so I know it pretty well. Um, but also that meant that I knew coming into this that the book's story is rather unusual. The book's story is really an allegory of a chess match, whereby Alice becomes the queen and then moves the right chapters. And it isn't really, it's a very strange sequence of events, and it is, it's beautiful and great, but it doesn't really work as a typing narrative to sit down to watch for an hour and a half. So I was really quite keen to kind of combine elements of the book, the things I thought were important in the book, like the things like the backwards room, not the looking glass itself, but at the same time use the characters from Tim's movie try and tell a story which feels, in terms of the spirit of Lewis Carroll and the Carolian in its sense of language, in terms of grammar, etc., but an original story. So we tried to keep, use elements of the book in terms of, you know, locations and some, some of the dialogue, but really the story is an original story. It's a new story which Linda Warburton wrote uh, and, and, and kind of served as both a prequel and a sequel to the first movie in a way. Great. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Our next question comes from Patty. Uh, Molly? Hello? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, now I can, now I can. Yeah, 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 okay. okay, I think it's taking minutes on mute. Well, thanks for coming online today. So I just wanted to ask you, so what's a typical day on the job for the director and specifically for post-production editing days? Oh, you mean, sorry, so a typical day in, in direct life, in shooting or for production, I couldn't hear. In shooting for regular days, shooting. Oh, okay, so shooting, well, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, well, normally, as in directing, by the time you get on the set, you really should have a great idea as to what you're doing that day. I mean, I, you know, when, for me, I'm always been a stickler for planning. And in a film of this scale, you really have to know way ahead of time what you're doing that day and how it's going to work. And even in terms of blocking and shots, that's what works out in advance. So basically, it's more of a physical endurance, the actual shoot itself, in terms of just making your day. So you tend to get up incredibly early, like at a, a 4.30 or so, and you get to set. Ahead. Shooting calls normally for 7 or so. It depends on what you're doing. If you're outside, it can be even earlier, like 5. If you're on a stage, you want to try and keep it human. And obviously, it's <laughs> got, got around about 7 o'clock or so. Um, so I'm often there at 6.30 or so. Uh, and then it's really a question of what you're doing that day. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, pretty intense stuff with uh, actors in terms of scenes, particularly when it's a more emotional scene, you want to talk to the actors about the scene itself prior. Uh, I'm not a huge believer in rehearsal. I mean, I do it occasionally, but I tend to do it on the day because I like the continuity of performance. Uh, and also comedy background tends to mean that rehearsal, you kind of often lose the juice in the rehearsal, but kind of trying to keep that going. Uh, and so then you just basically try and, you know, push through the day. You tend to know what you're doing. But often you've blocked it out in your head, and often you then are working out with the actors on stage what they're doing. And often, of course, they have ideas, they input ideas, you listen to them, they listen to you, and you work out how the team's going to play. Uh, and then you shoot. I mean, obviously, in terms of shooting time, often these days we have <laughs> no lunch, whereby you just shoot continuously for 10 hours. Sometimes people shoot six hour box, uh, or five hour box, whatever the time. But then your day ends sort of uh, seven ish, not eight ish. But obviously, it being filmmaking, things can go awry and, you know, things can push on. And, you know, often, you know, I often say that the last part of my job is to keep my watch, <laughs> which is true. Uh, and, and so it's a thing of just planning it there and making it as you can and then getting it right. And then, of course, the great response to the director is calling it what you've got it. And that's one of those great choices you're making. Right. But then you, you carry on filming until eight or nine, and then you, <laughs> you finish the day, you wrap up, and you kind of re re go over what's going to happen tomorrow. Often you go back and you watch daily from the day before, um, depending on how tired you are, and then you tend to finish around 10 or 11. So you can imagine the shooting is pretty physically demanding, uh, and you better be ready to do it because it's going to take up a lot of your time and energy. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Our next Fine. question comes from University of Southern California, the Daily Trojan, Sam Newman. 
Hi. Um, I'm actually Hi. on behalf of Sam. Um, so you've uh, taken on such iconic characters in your direction experience from uh, The Muppets to Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how yeah. you deal with the pressures of adapting such classic stories while still putting your own original touch on them. That's a good question. Um, I mean, really for me, a lot of it is still making me so subjective because it's about your own personal opinion to a degree. And I feel that both of Muppets and Alice, you have a very clear idea of what they mean to me. And then my, trans my, my implementation of the work in, in arises from that. So I have a sense of what I think they are. Like the Muppets, I remember them very clearly from my childhood. And I remember why I liked them. And so I wanted to try and make them feel like that again. And that was kind of what I was doing with them. And so you, you are aware of the responsibility because obviously I'm not the only person who loves these characters. Everyone loves these characters. So but you, all you can do is, as ever in this situation, is try and be true to your own sense of what they are and who, how, how they behave and what they mean and, uh, and, the, and the space they occupy in, in the world like that. And so it's a, it's a responsibility, but at the same time, with Muppets particularly, it felt like they hadn't been around for a while, and so I kind of try and reintroduce them to you know, people in a, in, in a way. And, and my kids, who were grown up at the time, didn't know they were, and that felt like a very bad thing. Um, reality is in a different direction, it's been around forever, and it's incredible for making a movie which is, you know, it's like 150 years old. And it's a great testament to Lewis Carroll and his incredible imagination that we're still interested in this world. And so, again, it's that thing where you have a responsibility, and I want to be true to Lewis Carroll, but at the same time, I want to make a film whereby you are transported to an incredible place an hour and a half of. You know, and that's another part of the story where Lewis Carroll thinks was more interested in, <laughs> in mathematics and structure, and I'm more interested in narrative and storytelling. So I guess that's kind of like trying to pay tribute to that work and be true to it, but at the same time making it relevant to you know, my children, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay, um, our next question is UC Berkeley, The Daily Cal Californian with Levi, mm -hmm. Levi Hill. Hi, okay. James. Hey there. Uh, first question, um, how different um, is it doing family films such as The Muppets and the sequel and now Alice in the Looking Glass compared to your more adult-oriented TV work like Spider the Conquered, Enlightenment, or uh, <laughs> The Allergy Show? Yeah. Um, you know what? I mean, really, it's not that – it's really not different. It's funny. I mean, I always think Concord, even though it does have references which make it slightly uncomfortable sometimes because at heart was a thing which was for everybody. One of the great joys of Concord was to go and watch the the guys, and there'd be people of all ages there. And so I think Concord's and Muppets was not that different. It felt like very similar territory. And I thought, in a way, it's kind of where my humor... My, obviously, humor is a very broad church. Everyone has different sense. You know, your humor can encapsulate all sorts of forms of humor. I was just trying to make things work on a number of levels. That's what I think is consistent across my humor, is that I like things that work for numbers of different reasons and can be appreciated by different people for different reasons. And that's what I like about, you know, both... And that's what also, what I guess, to the degree about Borat. I mean, Borat was a character whereby... He's funny because he's, he's crazy and he does some terrible things. But at the same time, he still understands that the breakdown of post-Soviet Eastern Europe. He's interested in that character too, so you can appreciate that character on a number of levels. And I've always wanted to make Muppets like that too, whereby I could watch it with my five-year-old daughter at the time, and she'd laugh and I would laugh, but often for different reasons. And then I guess with Alex, it's that same idea, whereby Lewis Cowell was a total genius and a, a mathematical impresario, a totally incredible guy. And he wrote Alex in a very interesting way, which meant that you could tell it to a story for children, but if you liked language and if you liked, you know, the entomology, you'd like that Lewis Carroll. And so it's the idea that there, all these various strands of my sense of humor all have this sense that they work on a number of levels. I guess that's the thing that holds them all together. Awesome. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, next question is UC Berkeley uh, again. Yeah, that's good. Good, good <laughs> right. Good right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so my next question is, uh, do you, did you feel obligated to follow the um, the style set forth by Tim Burton, um, which was considered to be one of the strongest film, or elements of the first film, or did right. uh, Disney and Burton being introduced on the film kind of allow you to handle the sequel in your own manner, in your own way, and kind of find your own visual rhythms within the film? Yeah, well, obviously, it, it's both, really, because obviously Tim is such, again, his, his visual style is so strong and so beautiful that the first film, it just looked incredible, and I love that as well. It makes sense of character design. I think that's the, something I couldn't really, I didn't want to change. It was just so brilliantly done. And I, and, I, and I think really, when you're making a film which is a sequel, you have to stay true to the original design in the sense that it feels like it's the same universe. It's the same world. But what was good about this film was that it was this, this current new movie is set both before and after that film. So in that sense, and also geographically, it's a different location. There are different places we visit which we haven't been to before. But then I had a chance to try and do things that I found interesting on, whilst obviously, you know, being aware and paying tribute to that work and making sure you stay in that universe. 
I could then incorporate some of the ideas I had about how the world should feel. Uh, and also, to a degree, the story itself in this film is more human in a way. There are more human there are people in it, in a way that there were in terms of but there were courtiers and they were unusual. This film has more of a sense of, uh, I guess, it's like the house of family and all, all human characters and there's a town. And, uh, you know, so there's a certain, I guess, slightly more photo real, I guess, to the degree element of it. But obviously, historically, photo real, as you know, as you might say. But also, I've always been a huge fan of um, John Tenniel, who is the guy who did illustrations in the original books. Uh, he was a pitiful cartoonist in England, and he did two books, one, Ask Wasserman and Ask Looking Glass, and both of them are very striking, and I think I actually grew up in England. This is the version that you read, so I'm very familiar with that, those visuals. And so to me, I wanted to bring a bit, bit of that element back into the world, whereby it had a sort of slightly Victorian caricaturist feel to it. Uh, and so that's kind of what drove some of the designs in terms of the new character we're finding the film. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, hey, uh, our next question is New York University, NYU Motion Picture, Anthony Zangrillo. I'm not, I'm not joined us, um, so I will go ahead and ask. Hi. Uh, oh. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah, this is Andres <laughs> on behalf of Anthony. Hey. Uh, so my question is, okay. uh, how do you approach creating the unique areas of wonder? And does your process involve your own sketches or more in-depth concept art? Sorry, I can hear. I can hear. You cut out a bit, so I can hear that. Repeat the question, please. Sir. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you approach creating the unique areas of Wonderland? And does your process oh, involve? Yeah. Uh, yeah, does your process involve your own sketches or more in-depth uh, concept art? Um, yeah, uh, both really. Uh, uh, when you read a script, you can't help but visualize it neatly in your head, and so that's just your own brain creating images for you, and that's often based on your knowledge base of things you've read and the w world you've explored and things you've been excited by. And so it's instantly in your head, and it's very personal, that's the sort of thing you come up with. So often I would do sketches, because I like drawing, so I'd often do little sketches of places. In this film, for example, Time, made by Sergeant Baron Cohen, had a castle, he lived in this incredible void. And I had an idea about this distance and some sort of obstacle to get to where he was, and it being to do with time and the gigantic clocks made out of stone and that kind of stuff. So those are kind of ideas that only had me start sketching them out. But obviously, after a while, he's got handing that over to actual professional concept designers. And then it's always good to have a sketch or something, just because obviously visually it's easy to tell a story that way. But then you describe what you're feeling about a place. And often these guys are so brilliant at their job, they can interpret that into actual visuals. And particularly for the lighting, obviously my sketch is tend to be just 4B pencil on a piece of paper. Um, whereas a concept art can provide a lighting sense of space and place, and that really helps. So it, it often initially starts with drawings and then enters in the work of concept design, but you know, beyond that, then it's a question of how you see it and how you visualize it. And for me, a lot of it was because I was very interested in the Victorian world of, of imagination. Victorians obviously were of a, of a time prior to that of science fiction. You know, they really are, a lot of their fantasy worlds are based on things like nursery rhymes and just that sort of thing I really like the idea of. And so, you know, often they're quite historical, historically based. And as a, a, a former historian, I love that about the world. The Victorian fantasy world is based, based on medieval stuff, for example. So I try to incorporate elements of that in the design throughout the film. And, and that's kind of what we ended up with, which is slightly more, I guess, a little historically accurate kind of world. Oh, great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, next question is from Molly, University of Cincinnati. Hi. Um, oh, hello. Hello. Oh, Fun world explorer there. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask you was: You mentioned that you built a lot of sets um, in real time for the movie. I know you mentioned you built a set of wicked ends. So I was wondering what the process was like building that. Oh yeah, wicked end. Wicked is the town in the movie. It's basically the place where the hatter has his family has a shop there. He sells hats, uh, and it's also where the Red Queen and White Queen grew up. So it's, it's, it's that really, design-wise, and again, it's a blend of influences. I, I always like, I mean, again, I've, I've often enjoyed walking around small English villages and being uh, understanding how they grow every time. And it's just, then, they, so things were designed, they weren't really planned. It's sort of, we call it, <laughs> we call it higgledy-piggledy, and it's just, and it's the sort of thing where things are just built up of each other all the time. So you get a real sense of place through time. And so when I was designing with Send, I wanted to place that felt like it had been there for a long time and developed in a very random way and didn't really necessarily obey the laws 
of architecture to a degree because through time buildings settle and move. And so I wanted this place to feel like that and at the same time have an element of magic. So I think the idea of Wonderland to me is the idea of history plus magic. And so I really wanted to have a sense of why these buildings almost shouldn't stand up because of the angles that they're, they're built at or the angles they're standing at. It should be impossible. The idea of impossible buildings also appeals. Uh, and so Whitstand is a kind of mixture between, I guess, uh, like a Cotswold village in England and like old town Dubrovnik, and it has trees on the roofs and strange flowers growing throughout it. So it needs to have both this feel of historical accuracy and time having passed there, but at the same time have a sense of that magic happens here. And so that's kind of what, and so that also helps in terms of the colour choice in terms of the place you live in and, and, how, and how that blends together to create a sense of uh, place, I guess. Awesome, very interesting. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Okay, uh, next question is St. Louis University, Todd Johnson. Yep. Hi, James. Thanks for doing this. Um, Hello. So you sort of answered this with the last question, but how will the setting uh -huh. and appearance of Through the Looking Glass differ from Alice in Wonderland? Right. Um, well, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it, it, it basically does two things. One is it, it, it has to stay in the world that's in Craig. It has to feel as similar to Lex because I don't want to feel like you're something completely different. So certainly in terms of character design, they are very similar. Uh, um, but and, and the world has a certain feel to it, which feels like it's at the same place. But at the same time, I was uh, able to do things because I was setting it, the movie set in different places at different times. And so therefore, I could try and incorporate other ideas which you know, are justifiable because it's a different place at different times. And I was, I'm always interested in history, and so this place feels slightly more historically accurate, slightly more historically real. Like, it's all the place you could have actually visited once. Like, I do feel that the Wits End feels like the back streets of the Protonic or some central European provincial town in the 19th century because it has that feel of having been lived in for a very long time. And that was very important to me because I love the idea of place and how it changes through time. Um, and so that was, that was part of it. But at the same time, as I said, the idea of magic being incorporated to the place, the fact that this is a land where the population is both human and frog and fish and dodo and some people with heads of animals. So it has to feel like this is a place where they could live and therefore has a slight magical sense about it. And obviously you could do this in CG, but for me a lot of it, the fun of it is being able to build this place and have the actors interact with that world. And I've always liked films like, you know, Charlie and Chocolate Factory in the 60s, you know, in the version of and Oliver in the 60s, these have gigantic, beautiful built sets outdoors. So with which end, I was very keen to try and build a set which has that kind of magic about it. Thank you. Good. Okay, um, Anthony Zangrillo in my U Mission Picture Club. Hi. Uh, hi, hi again. <laughs> um, this is Andres again. Uh, Unmuted. Uh, hi, this is Andres. Yeah, um, no worries, yeah. On behalf of Anthony. So, uh, could you discuss the experience of directing Johnny Depp as uh, one of these most eccentric and iconic roles as the, the Mad Hatter? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, Johnny's done it, Johnny did, the, did it, done it before. He knows his character very well. When he created the character with Tim, I think they kind of independently came up with an idea, the same idea. It's always a good sign. Like, it's what it should be. Uh, and so he very much was aware of this character and how this character plays and how he works and strengths, etc. So for me, it was kind of a question of using that knowledge in terms of shaping the character for this film. Because in this film, what I loved about the way he played the Hatter was that it wasn't the sort of obvious, you know, page one idea of just being crazy. He plays it in a very vulnerable way. And Johnny's best characters, I find, are characters that you have, have a great vulnerability about them. And so in this film, we're very keen to use that as a kind of emotional device to provide a, an engine for the movie, like the idea of saving the Hatter was a very simple and effective way of having Alice take on this task. And so for him, it was kind of trying to create a sense of that tragedy in his life very quickly at the beginning of the film with Alice, that Alice and she have a special relationship, and Alice is the one person who might understand the thing he's going through, and yet she doesn't, and therefore it's a great tragedy, and that's the thing that kind of is killing him. Uh, and so we were talking about that, and to an me about the vulnerability of the Hatter, and how it um, has this great sense of way of conveying his sadness, you know, in, in a way which you can imagine with the Hatter. The Hatter is supposed to be this crazy, quite driven crazy by, you know, his work, and it's just, it's, 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 much, it's a very clever idea of trying to make him into a more vulnerable character. I really like that. And then when he comes back, obviously, it's great because he's, he's in the character. Yeah, no, Johnny was, was great and very interesting all that stuff in talking about how that works and how the character is different in this film at the beginning and then at the end comes back more towards the guy, you know, in the first movie and that kind of, we talked about that a lot. Oh, uh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And I uh, I just realized I skipped over someone. Um, so our next question okay. come over um, from John Carroll University, Morgan. Or yep. Okay. Hi, James. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? Good. Thank you for asking. All right. So my question, um, well, basically the sequel brings back uh, the previous film's characters, and you just spoke about um, Johnny's character, but um, in this mm -hmm. film we have Mia back, Helena, and, and then, you know, especially the late Alan Rickman. Um, so what new additions or stories were added to their characters, and what was it like working with them on this film? Oh, well, they're all, they're all painted by heroes of mine, so it was amazing. Um, really, the characters are so so well formed by the first film. What this film tries to do is just, I love the idea of exploring why people are how they are. And so this one, particularly for the Red Queen and the White Queen, is exploratory and, and suggests, I think, to the degree that things aren't always as simple as good and evil, and some people are bad and some people are good. That things often that there are much more, more far more many shades of grey to that situation than one might imagine. So I think it's a very interesting idea that we're we'll trying to explore their backstories to a degree. Um, and, and and then with in terms of new characters, I was very keen to introduce people who felt like they were off this world. So for example, Sasha's character, Time, is it, really whilst well, an idea that I had in terms of the character was not my idea. It was Lewis Carroll's idea. When Hatton first meets Alice in the first book, he says, um, "I've been stuck at this tea party since the last month when Time and I quarrelled." I thought, oh, that's a good idea for a character. But I did in Wonderland, in, in Wonderland, sorry, in Lewis Carroll's mind, time is a person. But time is a personification of time that exists you can talk to. And I thought that would be a fun, if you were going to do it, the movie was about time travel even then. And I thought, it's very British to have to ask permission to travel through time. I thought it'd be great to have a bad guy, or an incompetent bad guy. You'd have to ask if you travel through time. Uh, and so that's how time came about. And then Sasha, of course, was a, a, a no-brainer for me because I knew him so well and what they made times before. And I knew he'd be fantastic at playing, uh, 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 again, a, a bad guy you feel sorry for, which I was, was a favorite. And so that's how that came about. But no, the, the, the old characters are the fun to try to draw, you know, some of their best stories, for sure. Thank you so much. That's okay. Okay. Our next question comes from Will from Hofstra University. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have Hi, no have me on. So my question is about the late, great Alan Rickman. Um, obviously, he passed yep. away just recently. So my question is, what was it like um, working with such a legendary actor, especially in one of his final performances? <laughs> well, it was amazing, obviously. I mean, you know, again, he's an absolute legend of both uh, screen and stage in the UK. In England, he's very well known for his theatrical work since the 1980s. Obviously, since then, you know, since then, then he made Die Hard and things changed. But he was an absolute total genius to work with, it. an incredible, powerful performance, and in terms of his voice, it's that great thing about him is that he had, had that voice that was so utterly recognizable, the moment he opened his mouth, he knew that was him, and that's an incredible talent to have, and he's so, for Absalom, the character was this incredibly wise and inscrutable character, you were never quite sure whether he's helping you or not, but and Alan instantly has that in his voice, he has that great sense of, of knowledge and of wisdom, but also he's just slightly ambivalent as to whether, whose side he's on, and I love that about him character. He played it so beautifully. He's done it before, of course, so you have to find out. And that's when this film is, is developed. He's quite a fighting as well. Uh, of course, he's a, a character in the first one. Um, but still, he has that same sense of being... He, he is... He helps Alice, but in a way whereby he wants her to work it out for himself. And that was very good by the character. But certainly, you know, Alan was just fantastic. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great shame, you know, it's a tragedy, because, of course, he was a brilliant performer and had far, had far, 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 far too little time with him, frankly. But I'm obviously honored to have him as, as in the film, and this being his last film, it's, uh, you know, it's just an honor, honor for us. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay, our next question comes from the Hoya, Emily Walsh from Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she was able to join us, but um, I'll go ahead and ask the question on her behalf. Alex's sure. Looking Glass introduces several new characters, notably Time himself, played by yeah. Baron Cohen. You and Sasha go way back. What made you think he would be a good fit for Alice? Did you decide you wanted Sasha before writing his character time into the script, or vice versa? <laughs> um, contemporaneously. They both happen. When, you, when you're when thinking about ideas, often somehow the person to play that person gets into your head, and you may not even be aware of it at the time. But certainly it felt to me that when I realized that time could be a bad guy in this film, I didn't want him to be the ultimate bad guy because that's the Red Queen, that he would be a fairly useless antagonist. And... Yeah, at the same time, I wanted it to be likable. Uh, it was very important to me that the character, uh, you felt sorry for him, uh, uh, because I like the idea that time is lonely, the idea that he has this, this, this godlike persona, and yet he's surrounded by just these 
steam-driven robots who don't really give him any, <laughs> any feedback about his self. And so Sasha is very good at playing, vul- again, playing vulnerable, like play, playing vulnerable characters. One of the reasons he was Borat was supposed to tell something that people felt sorry for Borat. And he's very likable, despite his terrible opinion and, and his ways of behavior. Uh, and I knew that Sasha would play time in a way by why you'd like him to be the guy who's incredibly confident and arrogant and you know, can't see his own flaws. But at the same time, you understand that he is flawed and you do feel sorry for him because he is lonely and therefore vulnerable. And I knew that also, particularly in, you know, you know, one of the lines in the film, he did, not in the film, sadly, but, it was, it was, you know, he, he's, he's conquered by love. He says, you know, love, love, I've con- I was conquered by love and I'm conquered by love. And that's a funny idea to me that he's 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 a pregnant for every other every other idea, but love is a thing that brings him to his knees and, and it defeats him. And that I thought was a very cool idea. Uh, and so that was fantastic saying that by you just like the guy and that and that was very important to me that he's a very likable bad guy. Awesome, thank you. And then our next question is from Emory University. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alana. Hi, how are you? Very well. How are you? I'm great. So, I view Alice as one of the strongest female leads in recent cinema. What does the character yeah. of Alice mean to you and to cinema as a whole? Oh, well, I think to literature as a whole. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, what, what's the great appeal to me, is, and I mean, this is to everybody, I hope, is that I really feel that Lewis Carroll had this, this amazing perception of Alice Little, who was a real girl he wrote to in the 1860s and 70s. Uh, who was growing up uh, at a time when women's roles in the world were very different and in a very patriarchal society. And I think he felt things were changing. And I feel that he recognized, and if you look at it, Alice Little, the real Alice, who worked book for, was born in the same uh, decade as Emmeline Pankhurst, who in the future, in, in, in the 1900s, became the leader of the uh, suffragette movement in England who got women to vote. And I feel that Lewis Carroll was very perceptive of this changing role of women in society. And so I think he imbued Alice with the way he saw girls at the time as being capable of independent thought, not being defined by other people. And I think this stuff is so strong for Alice, and I think that's in many ways why she resonates with today, because it feels a very, an idea which is very ahead of its time, and yet it's still relevant today, because this, 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 the, the solutions haven't arrived. We, you know, look at how many women protagonists there are in cinema, very few, and that needs to be addressed. And so I'm incredibly proud of the fact that the film has a female protagonist, and I think it's incredibly important, because Lewis Carroll started this, and I, and I think that he would be pleased with the progress that's been made, but by no means has the job been done. Great, thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question, um, and it's from Entertainment Monthly, Wyatt Muma. Hi, um, my question is, this is your first, well not your first, but um, your previous project had a lot of um, different music integrated in the storytelling, so... Um, <laughs> Was it different to try and do such a big production without it? And if you could musicalize the <laughs> film, how do you think it would best fit? <laughs> uh, if I could put music in everything, I would. Um, no, you know, I, I was aware this would not be a musical, so I knew that would be the case. But it doesn't mean that music is important to the movie, because obviously the score is incredibly important. Right? I've so talked with Danny Elfman, whose work I've always admired. Uh, he does a great job in the first one. Uh, and so music is, as a, it plays a big role in the film because it sets feelings and tones throughout the film and there's no actual sequences of dancing and singing or anything, which is what I love. But at the same time, you know, the story works very well without. And so it's a thing whereby you use music in a different way. Um, but that's not to say I, I wouldn't always like to put a song in there somewhere. And we do, you know, we have, we have moments in music. And there's, you know, there's dancing at the balls at the beginning. There's a whole sequence in the middle of it. It's an, an, an insane asylum with, a, with an orchestra she cut. But there were moments in music which were in there. But there are a few that are left. Uh, <laughs> I do always like music and music wherever I possibly can. Thank you. All right. Um, that's all the time we have. Thank you, James, right. once again. For Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone.